presented by Anadi Martel from Quebec, Canada. Uh, ma many of you have been here the last couple of years, have seen uh, live demonstrations of Sensora. You've experienced the light and sound uh, uh, modulation experience, uh, but we're really privileged. We're going to find out the science behind it and the thinking behind it. Uh, Anadi has many uh, patents uh, in, for technology, both uh, light, sound. He's worked with large companies like Philips, Lucentes, Walt Disney. He's even done the lighting for uh, Circus du Soleil. Um, du Soleil. And um, anyway, he's here today to uh, enlighten us all about this, this whole other concept of how to, how to manipulate light and how to modulate it for biological and psychological effects and his special interest is in raising consciousness. All right. Thanks, Larry. So I think, uh, can you hear me? I think everybody's probably pretty tired. There's been so much information already today, so um, I'll try to keep it uh, easier, simple, and on, on a lighter subject, let's say. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, because uh, the, the field I work with is, involves light and technology, but it also involves art and, and um, more therapeutic aspects, but more lively and beautiful aspects. So we'll try to uh, use mostly those for the next hour so that you're not totally wiped out. And actually, uh, the idea at the end of this presentation is to give you uh, like 15 minutes of uh, a color session. Again, to try to recharge you through, uh, through color and light energy after such a, a day of concentrated thinking. All right. So the method I work with, I call light modulation. Uh, is this working? Yes. OK, what is um, modulation is a very general term. It simply uh, basically means the process of modifying a signal with another signal. You're modulating something with something else. So this is used in electronics uh, in, in many, many different ways. It's widely used in uh, communication. When you listen to radio, you're listening to a modulated electromagnetic field. Uh, when you uh, connect to the internet, you most likely go, to go through uh, fiber optics, which use modulated light at very high frequencies. So these are all ways of using modulation to achieve uh, different ends. In our case, what we're interested in is using uh, modulation on light, but at um, much lower frequencies to get basically visual effects. And uh, the two main things that we can modulate in light, the two main properties, is the, uh, the intensity or the brightness or the number of photons, basically, and the color of the light or the frequency. Of course, as was mentioned today, there's other parameters that could be played with, such as the coherence or the phase or the polarization of light. But let's say the technology hasn't reached the point where you can easily modulate these parameters. And in any case, there's plenty we can do with just intensity and color for the time being. Um, so the 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 way I, went, I reached the, this kind of work, I worked first with uh, sound synthesizers, actually. That's where I started uh, my uh, research. And uh, so whenever you work with sound synthesizers, you uh, immediately have to work with oscillators, what's called low-frequency oscillators. And these are used to modulate the sound signal in the synthesizer to create interesting uh, sound effects. So I was building sound synthesizers, and I was also uh, experimenting with light. So I thought, why not mix both together, use uh, low-frequency oscillators to control light? So from that point, I uh, uh, started gradually, and I, I evolved the uh, various modulation structures uh, to reach a system that uh, was flexible enough to create interesting effects and to bring new aspects in, in the, uh, the way we uh, work with light. So here, for example, you have a typical modulation structure with which I work. It uses three oscillators. Um, two of them are controlling the intensity of light. 
And the third one is controlling the color or the, the frequency of the light. It goes through a light modulator and then this is normally uh, controlling three primary colors, three projectors, uh, that are combined for additive uh, synthesis of uh, light to get all the colors of the rainbow. As we know, this uh, additive method has its limitations, but it's the most practical to use um, with current technology. It would be great to, have, uh, to be able to modulate a monochromatic light generator. That's a, a dream, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so what I showed you here actually is a, a, a modulation structure that controls one set of three primary color projectors. So that would be one spot of light with which you can work. Then it gets more interesting if you use more of these spots. For example, in a typical system, I'll use five such groups of three primary colors. And they're usually aligned um, in a linear fashion along the screen. And the reason for that is that as you know, the, the brain and vision is uh, highly left-right oriented. The eyes are sideways, they're not exactly up and down. So it's preferable to work uh, with lateral movements. It's also nice to work with uh, vertical movements, but then you need more equipment, more projectors. So this is kind of the most efficient way to generate interesting effects with a limited number of resources. Uh, so, as soon as you work with oscillators, by definitions, you're working with spe specific frequencies. And that opens up a whole world of uh, interacting with the body, with, uh, with uh, the visual system, with the energy of the people through specific frequencies. Now, this can easily get quite esoteric. Uh, this, and uh, um, you can also view it in a very simple way. Um, it's simply a matter of um, creating resonances with the biological phenomena happening in you, whether it's brain waves, whether it's uh, movements in cells or the blood flow. There's all these phenomena in our body are vibrating right now at different frequencies. And when you, work, when you apply pulsing um, stimuli, whether it is light or sound or electric field or whatever, you, uh, you create resonances with these different phenomena. And as soon as you create a resonance, you amplify greatly the, the particular energy you're working with, the particular system that you're resonating with. So as soon as you work with um, oscillators and frequencies, you open up a whole new way of interacting. So the frequency range with which we're working in this light modulation process uh, is shown here. It's roughly a hundredth of a hertz to 50 hertz. Uh, why this range? Well, the, the top uh, limit of it is pretty much limited by the flicker fusion frequency. That, that's the maximum frequency that the typical eye uh, can perceive. If you have a, a vibration faster than that, you stop seeing it. It just averages to a, a constant signal. The eye cannot resolve a faster pulsation. So you can, of course, modulate light at high frequencies. And you, you also have very interesting effects. But they're not really visual at that stage. You work more with frequency-specific therapy and such. And others uh, are much more expert in these fields than I am. So basically, we work up to about 50 hertz. And in fact, um, depending on which type of projectors you use, you may even be limited to lower frequencies. If you work with halogen or incandescent projectors, it's hard to go beyond 20 hertz because the um, allergen light, the incandescent light, stops responding. And uh, above 20 hertz, you don't get much pulsation left out. At the other end of the spectrum, um, I say 100 of a hertz. And the reason for that is that if you go slower than that, that's about equivalent to a cycle of one minute. If you, go, if you create a phenomenon that's slower than one minute, it gets so slow and spread out that you kind of lose the feeling that it's a unified uh, phenomenon. It just starts splitting into separate components, and you don't get this flow anymore. But up to about one minute, you can still create continuous waves that are perceived as being one unified phenomenon. So we have this whole range to play with. And it so happens that it pretty well overlaps the brain waves range, about 2 to 80 hertz. 
could go higher if you uh, include gamma, high gamma, and all that. Um, you uh, and we're below the the, the sound realm, so it's really um, lower frequencies. And actually, it's this range is pretty much centered around one hertz, uh, which, in terms of perception. Uh, corresponds to uh, the kind of limit, limit between our two ways of perceiving pulsations. If you're at higher frequencies, you're in what I would call the, the perceptual frequency domain, in the sense that you perceive a pulsating phenomenon, something that's uh, moving quickly. Whereas if you go uh, with lower frequency of pulsations, you start to resolve the wave into individual uh, points. You, it's not anymore a pulsation, it's more uh, something evolving in time. So in terms of our perception, uh, this uh, limit here is uh, quite critical. It's really the way the brain starts inter uh, 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 interacting with these pulsations in a different way above and below this threshold. So this brings out um, many interesting phenomena, And this is also why um, my typical modulation structures have at least two oscillators to work with uh, intensity because it's usually interesting to have one oscillator working in the time domain, a very slow wave effect, and another oscillator working on the, uh, the frequency domain, perhaps uh, acting on a brain wave. So when you have both oscillators available, you have the option of working with both phenomena at the same time. That creates uh, many beautiful effects are generated by this combination. Um, so these diagrams just show you quickly so that you get a graphical idea of what this light modulation does to um, the light signal. The diagrams here, this is the time axis, and this is the, light, the intensity of a source of light. So we have a range of 0 to 100%. And in this case, for example, we're looking at a source of light which is at 80% of its maximum potential. Now we apply a low frequency oscillation on that. Here it's a triangle wave, and we can apply it with a, a small depth, li like here, or we can apply it with a full modulation depth. So it's really, you're modulating between the baseline and the maximum of this signal. And you have the whole range in between. So actually you can bring this modulation so, so uh, small that it becomes a barely perceptible fluctuation in the light. So the the synthesizer I work with gives you the whole range. You can really modulate from full amplitude to un barely perceptible phenomena. Here, for example, when you combine two low frequency oscillators, again here you start with the first one, which we saw on the previous slide, and then we use a second oscillator at a higher frequency in this example. That, for example, here it would be in the brainwave region. And when you superimpose both these pulsations, you get this kind of waveform. You get the slow pulsation and over on top of it this high modulation. Now, um, an interesting thing is to apply the same technique but to color, not, not to the intensity of light, but to the actual um, frequency of light. So it's often in, in color therapy um, very efficient to think of light as a wheel in the sense that once um, you go from the blue, which is the highest frequency that, you, um, that your um, uh, eye cells can perceive, and the red, which is in the lowest range, uh, interestingly, if you mix these two, as you well know in, in uh, color theory in our practice, you get magenta. You get this artificial color, which is not in the rainbow, but which is, um, uh, uh, creates kind of a continuum you can continuously vary, move through, uh, join, if you want, the two ends of the spectrum, and you obtain a wheel. So this is the model I use in, in uh, my synthesizers in the sense that the color parameter that you uh, modulate varies from, for example, here in this case, 0 to 127. That's the range. And that gives you one rotation in this color wheel. So for example, let's take here. Um, a yellow color, so the, the value 30 in my parameter. So you have a yellow color being generated by the system. And now you superimpose on that a modulating wave, here a triangle wave, with a certain amplitude. 
So this one will make, will make you run in the color wheel from, for example, yellow to blue. So you will be oscillating between these two here as the wave goes along. And if you increase the amplitude, um, normally you would just clip into the maximum. But because we have um, a wheel here, if we go above the red, we simply start rotating into the next wheel. It's a, you, you, you have a modulo mathematical operation. You basically remove one cycle. So it looks like that in practice in the, uh, for the system. So basically, you select any color you want. Then you mo add the modulation, and you give it the range that you want. And wherever you are in the color wheel, you will get a functional color oscillation. Now, um, it's not very common to, to use this kind of uh, color um, movement. Like in syntonics, in most color therapy, you have filters with specific colors. So you, you change from one color to the next. You can select. It's usually manually done with a, a fairly long delay because you, you want to stay with one color for a certain time. So the, the fact to have this capacity to be able to have color transitions, uh, color uh, movements in the frequencies, opens up new ways to, um, uh, to interact with the color. And um, when you combine that with the um, intensity modulation, intensity uh, pulsations, uh, you get even more. Uh, in fact, you get so many possibilities that it's, it can get pretty confusing. So a large part of the work in uh, creating such light synthesizers is to find ways to reduce the number of possibilities, to find the interesting ones, and combine them in ways um, that are efficient and meaningful. So other things you can play with in a, in a synthesizer, just as you would in a sound synthesizer, is the, the wave, uh, the shapes of the waves that you're using to modulate. We've seen triangle, you could use sine wave for more natural organic um, movements. Square waves, of course, to go direct from one value to another. Ramping waves. You can also play with the duty cycle of these things, make them longer up than down. You can play with the phase, and that's very important in light modulation because you, we're playing with very slow movement sometimes, spreading over many seconds. So the phase of this modulation wave is essentially the time lag, how, you, how it's delayed in time. And when you work with many light zones, like we showed uh, here, here. So if you have oscillators running on all of these and you introduce a phase difference between, so the, uh, the visual effect that you will obtain is uh, like the, the movement moving gradually across the screen. So you can generate uh, movements by working with the phase of the signals. And that's also one of the very interesting aspects of this system. Uh, because doing all that, you um, basically make the light projection very much alive. It's moving, it's pulsing, and it's flowing. Uh, now, one obvious application of light pulsations is brainwave entrainment. So that's been used for a long time. There's a lot of research on that. Many color therapists have been working with that. and. Um, it's an extremely interesting uh, field. Uh, one thing we, uh, I noticed uh, listening to many of the, the researchers in this field is that uh, there was a period a few years back when it was very uh, used intensively. There was lots of experimentation. Stephen Vasquez used it. Many people, um, many of the instruments created can pulse light. And it, it seems like many people over the years kind of went away from it because they they realize using it in practice over the long term that it's a, uh, it's a very invasive thing to subject somebody to a stroboscopic pulse, intense pulsations of light. You will definitely get an effect on the brain. You will affect the brain waves. You will, um, in a way, force the brain into a certain pattern with this intense signal. Um, but when you want to work with more subtle energy, more soft approaches, it's not exactly the right, uh, the best approach. So um, this is where the, this concept of uh, being able to control m much more precisely the way you, you pulse the light um, becomes quite interesting. Because you can have your light brainwave entrainment, but with a much smaller amplitude. So here would be a typical stroboscope. 
pulsing, uh, you, you do get your brainwave entrainment, but you can get the same, uh, introduce the same frequency with a very um, soft pulsation. Probably if you measure the brain uh, wave, if you connect to EEG, you will most likely observe less of a brainwave entrainment effect, less photic driving with this softer signal. But in a way, in, in many cases, it's not really an issue. Uh, you don't necessarily want to, uh, as I said, force the brain into a certain pattern. By using a, a much softer signal, you still contain the information of that specific frequency. You still contain the, uh, the qualities associated with that particular brainwave frequency. And the system will still resonate uh, at a, a smaller level with this frequency. Because as you know, in resonance, uh, any resonance phenomenon, you need a tiny amount of energy. If you hit the resonance point, a very small amount of um, pulsation will still have a significant effect. Um, but it will be perceived as being much less violent, much less invasive. And of course, it greatly reduces the risks of uh, epileptic uh, um, seizures, which is always an issue when you, you work with uh, light pulsations. I've been working with this for 20 years now. I've seen thousands of people being exposed to the, uh, this kind of light pattern. I've never seen yet a single case of uh, epileptic seizure happening. And actually, on, on, on the contrary, I've seen people with epileptic sensitivity uh, greatly enjoying this type of light pulsation, this type of, um, of light effect, because for the first time, they could be exposed to these frequencies without um, being overwhelmed by them. And they could e we could easily, just by gradually increasing the level of the amplitude, they get used to it, they get comfortable with it. And uh, we've had very beautiful experiences with epileptic uh, people uh, working in this kind of way by uh, gradually increasing while always remaining within their comfort zone. Um, other aspects about brainwave entrainment that are made possible by this uh, more sophisticated light controller is uh, to uh, play with uh, laterality and um, peripheral, peripheral, sorry about my English, peripheral vision temporal sensitivity. As I mentioned, we normally work with a number of light zones spread across the screen. And the, the processor can, as a independent control for each one of these zones. So that brings us a lot of uh, um, possibilities, a lot of freedom. As you know, the, um, of course, as uh, all of you know very well, the perception of the eyes is crossed over in the, the um, chiasm. And when you expose the, the left field of vision to a, a light signal, it goes to the right brain and vice versa. Uh, so when you look at a large screen, what goes on on one part of the, the left part of the screen reaches your right hemisphere and vice versa for the left part, no, the right part here. So if you, um, you can therefore, uh, with a system that can control separately these zones, you can have different signals on each hemisphere and different intensities. And that opens up many interesting possibilities. In the same way, um, you can control the um, amplitude of the pulsation differently across the screen. So you can have a strong pulsation in the center and no pulsation at the um, sides, or vice versa. And an interesting um, use of that is that, um, as you probably know, the uh, peripheral part of the visual field is um, more sensitive to fast movements whereas the central part is more tuned to spatial precision. And uh, from the experiences we've done, we found that if you pulse the whole visual field, um, you can actually have much higher frequency, uh, uh, depth of pulsation on the peripheral um, parts of the field. And they are still not felt as so aggressive. The, the system, the brain can still process them and accepts them much more readily than when you're pulsing the central part, which really then um, hits the, the, uh, the region of the brain, which is not so well wired to deal with fast moving phenomena. So that's another possibility opened by the flexibility of such a system is to tailor 
the, the whole visual field with your brainwave pulsations. And as far as I know, um, um, not many systems gives, uh, give you this kind of flexibility. Uh, so the, I've integrated this system in a multi-sensorial environment. Uh, so here you see, this is a chair, this is a large screen, a hemispherical screen. And uh, this is the projection of five light zones here. And so the person is lying underneath the screen, which is tilted at about 45 degrees. So the intention here is that the person lying uh, at that spot has uh, his or her field of vision pretty much covered. The, the dimensions are such that when you're there, this whole, um, your whole field of vision is, is immersed in this, uh, these colors. And um, so as I mentioned, I started off working with sound. Uh, uh, originally, I designed sound specializers, devices to move sound in space, which are, have been used a lot in the cinema industry or IMAX films. So I integrated that aspect. Of course, why not make a, a full environment? So we have a special sound environment in this setup. And I've also been working with uh, kinesthetic vibrations. Um, the, the chair has an array of sound transducers that generate a wave of uh, vibration extracted from the, the sound that you're working with. And these three things are working together, are harmonized in a way you have to be very careful in the way you combine these elements so that you, you create a harmonious whole. And the, uh, the global effect of this is uh, quite powerful. It, it's, uh, it's enough in a way to kind of suspend your uh, current reality and bring you into um, a different dimension, another world of uh, perception. By the way, I've also worked with using uh, smells, uh, odors, which is very powerful and uh, uh, very interesting, but in practice uh, extremely um, difficult to use because whatever smell you want to spread in a, an area, the room gets saturated very quickly, and after a few days, uh, you can't get rid of those smells. So you can't modulate smell as easily as you can modulate lights and uh, sound, unfortunately. Uh, so the sensora, again, the sound specialization aspect, the light aspect, this projector here, and the chair with the kinesthetic vibration uh, surface. These are the three aspects of this multisensorial environment. All right, and um, yeah, this is just a brief view of the uh, hemispherical screen. Uh, extremely unpractical system. It takes many people to set up the screen. It takes a day or two. It's uh, not at all uh, streamlined as a, a commercial system, but um, that's what it takes to get this, uh, um, this immersive effect. All right. So I thought we could take a little break here and I'll just illustrate briefly with the light projector that I brought here some of the effects I mentioned. So if we could turn down the, the lights. I will uh, switch this off. So in the same way as um, Carl mentioned, to get the best of such light effects, you need darkness in the space where you work because you're trying to work with pure saturated colors. And if you have uh, stray light, they will dilute, of course, the saturation and the purity of these colors. For some reason, I lost my uh, cursor here. <laughs> here on the ah, that's what it is. How do I get it back, uh, Alexander? Oh, here it is. I got it. Okay. All right. So, here the projector is um, covering the screen. We've oriented the five zones so that we pretty much have uh, this large rectangular area. And uh, so, by mixing the three primary colors, we can go through pretty much the whole rainbow. So 
So unfortunately, Carl, it's not monochromatic. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's a bit, uh, it pales compared to the light we just saw before. But I can modulate it, which you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so the blue, and then the magenta, and then we're back on the red. We close the circle. No pure violet. I'm also sorry about that. I would love to integrate violet, but uh, again, uh, technically more uh, difficult in this context. All right, so now let's, let's put a, a bit of a more uh, less uh, stimulating color here. Let's work with green. Um, let's see what we can do with brainwave pulsations. Now there's no pulsation. We have a static field. So this is pretty much a stroboscopic effect. We're pulsing completely the, the light. This is what you would get of a... Not really so pleasant to look at. And I was, um, okay. Uh, of course, you can go through uh, different range. Here we were, um, now we're in the beta range, higher frequencies. Uh, as you can see, this is 15 hertz, 16 hertz. We still perceive it quite well. Oh, even we are at 24 hertz, still, uh, still quite perceivable. The whole system is designed to extract the highest frequency possible. It's special light bulbs. This is special uh, digital dimmers. You would, you would uh, have trouble to get this with uh, standard light projectors. Now we're going lower in frequency, back to alpha, theta. Again, let's make it softer and more friendly, like this, and down to delta, very low pulsations. And of course, your, your color modulation is still always available. You can do this with any color. And let's um, now look at the, uh, the use of um, the different areas of the screen. Um, for example, here I'm pulsing only the sides. Let's get a little higher frequency. Let's go back to a, a nice, pleasant uh, Schumann resonance frequency, which is the most. Uh, there it is. All right. So you can feel the difference. I can increase the intensity here. Well, the thing, of course, you are very far away from the screen, so it's not a very good test. Uh, normally, you should be sitting close enough so that this fills your field of vision. Then you would perceive these side effects much better. So this is just its more an illustration, basically, of the uh, capability. To experience it, you would have to be uh, in the correct setup. And this is working by introduce phase differences uh, it, phase differences in the, uh, the different, here you can perceive the, uh, the oscillation is there, but it's moving inwards. I don't know if you can see it. Instead of the whole screen uh, being uniformly pulsing, we introduce a phase difference. Let me try, maybe this is more visible. Now it's going towards the left. Now towards the right. So again, this type of effect um, are all different ways of making the light um, come alive in, in, uh, and becoming dynamic. And when you start to work with uh, lateral um, effects, whether you're moving uh, towards the left or the right, you do get different um, psychophysiological effects. 
but that's another uh, another aspect. We won't have time to get into that. Um, okay, let me turn down the uh, brain wave. So I I'm just going to show you a few more effects. Now we've been working with a single uniform color. We can start to work with uh, um, a visual field combining many different colors. For example, here we have a beautiful rainbow that's gently flowing across the screen. So we have a different color on each one of our five color zones. A very pleasant, uh, soothing effect. And because this is a, a synthesizer with all parameters easily uh, controllable, for example, here I can just by touching a slider make this go much faster. The idea is that uh, with few simple controls, you can generate pretty complex light patterns and modify them uh, quite easily. Different kinds of effects, uh, for example, uh, this is using slightly different frequencies of pulsing, low frequency pulsings, um, but um, by using a slightly different frequency on each zone, we get a random, randomized beat effect. So this is kind of a, gives you the feeling of water, a watery uh, effect, again, very soothing. Different type of effects, uh, what do we have here? Yeah, modulation with, uh, this is using phase, but starting from the center towards the sides. So it can get quite psychedelic in, in some ways. Especially when you work with complementary colors. Here, here you have red over green. Okay, so this was just a few illustrations. I don't want to spend too much time uh, because I'd like to talk about a few more aspects. So we will uh, cut that down. Maybe we can bring down the lights for a little while. And uh, if we have time at the end, I'd, right after the session, we can do a 15-minute light um, session so you can experience in a, a more... Uh, quiet way the, uh, the effect. Okay, how do I get out of here? Okay. Oh, so we're back. Um, could we turn on the, uh, the room lights for uh, not so nice to speak in the darkness? Okay, so one thing I want to point out, uh, as you very well notice, we can say there's two basic modalities of light therapy. One is uh, physical healing, using light to act on the body, on the cells, on the blood, on the autonomic nervous system. So um, physical level healing. Another aspect of using light is more on the, the psycho-spiritual influence, uh, meaning acting on the mind, the brain, the more subtle energy levels. And of course, these two overlap. Uh, there's a point where you don't really know whether you're working with the physical level or the psychological level or even the spiritual level. But uh, just for the argument's sake, we will separate these two ways of uh, using light. And um, the, the experiment, the work I've been doing is very well, uh, very much focused on the, the second aspect. I have absolutely no any pretension of uh, doing any physical healing uh, with a system of this kind. Although I, it's very well possible that somebody experienced on this type of work could benefit from using uh, this type of uh, light control. But I've been focusing on the second aspect. Uh, by integrating these multisensorial uh, components, um, and in this sensor installation you just saw, in the past few years we've observed many um, very beautiful effects uh, for example, it's very effective to bring about deep, profound relaxation in, in a space like that within a very short time. 
And all kinds of phenomenon happen. Uh, for example, uh, free associations of ideas, creativities can be brought up when you use uh, certain combinations of colors and frequencies. Uh, one thing that can be described uh, also as the, the, the dilution of the border between conscious and unconscious. Because when you are in that state exposed to this kind of uh, flowing light, it's a kind of a dreamlike vision in a way. So it brings you to that state which is between waking and sleeping. And it's a state that's very conducive to um, emergence of bur buried memories, or it can go, to many people we've seen have had spontaneous past life recalls. Uh, many surprising things happened. And we see commonly uh, something like a meditation state arising. Um, of course, um, I've been interested in meditation myself for a very long time. The, this whole work um, came out of my interest in meditation. So I know very well that uh, you cannot use technology to create meditation. Um, the best you can do is to use technology to create an environment where it's easier to meditate. Because ba meditation is basically an awareness phenomenon. You have to be, you're, you're trying to be aware of your own um, reality. And no machine or no technology can make you aware. You have to be aware yourself. So um, when I say spontaneously arising meditative states, I only mean that you create an environment in which it's easier, you, you remove obstacles, and then uh, the uh, meditative um, aspect can come up much more easily. And we've seen also occasionally healing phenomena, uh, resolution of traumas. Again, I'm not saying that this is happening every time you use this, uh, this kind of light, not at all. I'm just saying that over the years, we have seen many uh, uh, fascinating results from using this kind of light in a um, quite unpredictable and random way. But still, there has to be something. Why, why do we get this type of effect? What causes this kind of um, um, And actually, we, we uh, are still wondering ourselves. We don't have any answer as to why this is uh, effective. Um, we only have some uh, conjectures, some ideas, and I, I'm going to share a couple of them with you. <clears throat> One thing that's clear is that with using light in this way, we're enabling light to be used as a bridge between our common daily life perception and a higher, more, what I would call a more abstract level of our inner reality by connecting with this kind of dreamlike state. And uh, this is not something that can be quantified easily or described or measured, but at the same time, it shouldn't be underestimated because if you look at it, there's not so many uh, ways or technologies or uh, systems that give you kind of um, uh, this opportunity, this, this anchor on this phenomenon that can make, create this bridge between the, this inner realm and outer reality. So even if we can't really explain or quantify or measure clearly what's going on, it's still clear that this is a very interesting uh, area to be working in and, and we, um, we're trying to understand exactly why and um, what's in, uh, involved. And the idea, of course, would be to optimize the, uh, the combinations if we could understand better what's going on. So I'll just share some of the ideas that I have on this. And one is uh, coming out of um, studies on the brain studies on the color center. And I know that uh, Stuart this uh, morning was mentioning uh, many studies by Zeki in uh, the understanding of the color centers, how the, uh, the brain processes vision. The, uh, these people and Luek also uh, were the first using uh, originally PET scan of the brain to uh, were able to see what happens, uh, which centers of the brain process color and, and uh, how this thing works. And the way they did this, one of the early ways, was to use uh, what's called isoluminous Mondrian stimuli. Uh, so they create two uh, patterns to which subjects are exposed. And in one case, you have pure colors. And in this, the other case, you have the same pattern, but only in, in, on the grayscale. 
So, and they're arranged so that their luminous intensity is the same. So you, you'll be stimulating the visual centers in the same way, but one way with pure colors, the other way without colors. So um, I know that Robert mentioned that the early studies with, were done with, uh, with cats. And I've heard that they actually tried early on, but they had difficulty finding proper subjects. <laughs> so they had to drop the cats. And eventually, they managed to do it with uh, human subjects. And they came up with this uh, localization for the color processing areas of the brain. And uh, one thing that always struck me when I looked at these studies um, is expressed here by uh, Zeki. He says, the main result reported here is that when humans view colors in relation to objects, much larger parts of the brain is activated than when they view them in a more abstract context. So what that means, by using this Mondrian stimuli here, this is not any recognizable object. There's nothing to understand in this picture. It's just colors, pure colors. So when you expose the brain to that, there's nothing to stimulate the higher cognitive functions, uh, thought, memory, because there's nothing to understand, basically. So these centers of the brain will stay at rest. But at the same time, you will be stimulating the color centers. So for example, here, you have the, uh, the different color, uh, brain zones and the activation. On the left is with the um, uh, grayscale, and on the right is with the colored pattern. And of course, the color areas are much more stimulated with color patterns. That's to be expected. But look at the frontal eye fields, the, the, the frontal cortex, where the thought and, and cognitive uh, processes are happening. You've actually suppressed the effect, uh, and much more by using the pure colors than you did by using the, the um, grayscale pattern. So in a way, you, you've quieted this, um, these cognitive centers by projecting these pure colors. And at the same time, you very much activated the brain. It, this, these centers are very uh, lively. So what we have here is, is an interesting combination. <clears throat> We've created um, um, a, a pattern where we are stimulating the brain, and especially when we use um, uh, light, modu light modulation, as I've shown, you create uh, pure colors, based, of course, with light modulation. But these colors, because of the, um, the pulsations, because of the movement, are very fascinating. They're beautiful to look at. So they're not boring. So you can easily spend 10, 15, 20 minutes looking at these colors and uh, enjoying it. And being very, your attention is very focused on it because it is so beautiful. And at the same time, these, these colors contain absolutely no message, no content that your, your um, thought or your memory uh, can work with. There's no, nothing to be understood in, in these colors. They're just there to be enjoyed by, the, by the, the brain, the visual center. So you have this combination. You have the attention. And you have no, not, not much mental activation. And these two together, attention without mind, is just another word for meditation, basically. It's just being aware, being conscious with, with our thoughts. So this, in a way, in, in explains or kind of gives a pointer to what may be um, um, acting here. Another um, interesting way to look at this is uh, through the um, heart rate variability experiments. Um, actually, I think it's Larry who originally uh, uh, made me look into this. So possibly many of you are familiar with heart, heart rate variability. It's a measure of the uh, coherence. Uh, it's actually a measure, a spectrum analysis of the heartbeat. And what you're looking at is not the heartbeat itself, not the uh, ECG signal, but you, you're looking at the variability of this signal from pulse to pulse. And when you do a frequency spectrum of that, you can break, down, break it into specific uh, zones, frequency zones. And medically, they've been able to associate these different frequencies and the variability of the heart rate to uh, different phenomena. And one thing that's been observed is that, is that when you manage to uh, increase the coherence of 
these uh, beats from uh, beat to beat, you have all these effects uh, which are uh, well documented now. Greater synchronization between the two branches of the ANS, significant reduction in stress, anxiety, depression, increase in positive effects and attitudes, enhancement of humoral immunity, increase the HEA cortisol ratio, all kinds of good things, basically. And uh, so how do you reach this uh, heart rate variability coherence? Um, one of the pioneers in this research, um, um, McCready, is, is saying here, Individuals can maintain extended periods of psych physiological coherence by actively self-generating and sustaining a positive emotional state, such as appreciation, care, or love. Using a positive emotion to drive the coherent mode appears to excite the system at its resonant frequency, and coherence emerges naturally, making it easy to sustain for long periods. Or in other words, positive emotions create this heart rate variability coherence. If you create a, a positive um, emotional environment, if you, I mean, in practice, it, it has a very simple technique. You just close your eyes and imagine something uh, that brings a positive emotion, a feeling of compassion or remembering an especially pleasant moment in your life. And if you do that for a little while, automatically your heart rate uh, will become coherent and, and all these positive effects are generated. So my one impression I have is that when you use this kind of light, which has a great inherent beauty, in a way you touch the emotions, you achieve a similar result. You bring up these positive feelings and emotions purely through the appreciation of the beauty of color. And here um, I, I mentioned Carl because uh, for me it's always been clear that looking at monochromatic light acts in this way. It really accesses this feeling of awe, of, of pure beauty, and uh, generates these positive emotions automatically. And uh, so through light modulation, I feel, is another way, another avenue to use light to create this kind of uh, rich environment where you can touch the emotions. It's more than just, if you have a static light, of course, in a way, you will touch the emotions, because as you well know, Different emotions will be triggered by different colors. But if you enhance the, the display with the, this flowing organic movement, you, um, you create an environment where it's much easier to be uh, deeply touched. And that's what we observe in practice. Now, I don't know how much time have we got left. Not, not really much. Huh? So I guess this is the most important I wanted to say. We could uh, basically stop there. Um, yeah, the rest is not so essential. And we could just project for those who want a little 15 minute color session so you can experience in practice. The color session we'll use is actually generated through uh, Pierre Van Obergen's color test. Pierre will be talking tomorrow. And I've integrated in, as one mode of operation of this system um, his color test. So people can, within a couple of minutes, uh, make a very, through a very simple process, uh, touch some colors and choose which ones they like. And we end up with this kind of pattern where we can know which colors are the most beneficial for that in individual at that given moment. So it's another way to uh, generate colors um, that's kind of more tailored to the person. And what we will do for this uh, little 15-minute session is, um, of course, we, we can't have a test by everybody here, but we, we use kind of a composite pattern, which is, uh, should be very nice to uh, just relax us and wake us up a little bit after that, uh, that long day. So I guess we can be ready for that. Um, yeah, I suppose it's better if you have some questions first. And then we do the session, and that'll be the end. Pauline can show her uh, a video. So that would be it for my presentation. Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's quite fascinating with children. We get two quite extreme reactions. 
either the, the, some kids totally fall in love with it. They, they sit in that chair and they, you can't take them away from it. They absolutely love it. And some other kids is just, uh, uh, occasionally we see kids that just cannot uh, handle it. They're not really um, touched by it so much. This type of, of light pattern don't work with everybody. It's not universal. But uh, I would say it's only a minority of people who don't react uh, positively to that. Some people just find it, uh, um, uh, don't see the, the uh, it doesn't touch them. So with kids, uh, uh, it's, some kids are deeply touched by it. And we, um, people who work with uh, ADD and, and uh, such problems have told me many times that they feel it, it, could be, it could potentially be very helpful in that field. Because uh, you can, we could create light patterns that would be optimized for uh, uh, this type of uh, application. I would love to work in that field. I just never had the occasion, the opportunity to, uh, to apply it. Any other questions? So we could go to the projection. The, for those who, who are interested to get uh, the full, I mean, more of the experience, you could come closer. And um, I think there's space here for a few people. Those who are interested could just come closer to the screen so that you try to fill as much as possible of your visual feel with the, the projection. Yeah, I'll finish with the projection. So we will make this uh, 15 minutes long. And basically, it will be a journey to, through the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs>